Now, the part that I wanted to focus on in this chapter is uh, verses 3 and 4, because I want to preach tonight about the deity of Jesus Christ and the, and the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible, okay? Now, a lot of people, you know, this, this, attack this doctrine today, and a lot of people attack the Trinity and say it's a Catholic doctrine, okay? And they'll, they'll, there's what's called the Jesus-only movement. Who's ever heard of this? You know, it's these, these Pentecostals that we meet out in Soul Winning in South Phoenix. They say, well, you know... Jesus is God, but there's no Trinity. Like, no, no Father, Son will... And at first it sounds right. Like, yeah, Jesus is God. You're right. But they don't believe in the Trinity. Like, they don't believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay? They believe that the Holy Ghost is just, I guess, some kind of a force, or kind of like the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they're mixed up on this. And then there are other people who say, well, Jesus is not God. He's just the Son of God. But He's not God. He's only just God's offspring. You know? And uh, what I want, to, I want to show you some scriptures on that tonight and teach this doctrinally. We need to get back to preaching doctrine in church. Amen. You know, a lot of people, they go to church and it's always encouragement, it's always motivation, it's always firing you up. But if they don't, they're not grounded in what they believe. They're not firmly rooted on the doctrines of the faith. So we need to go through and see these things and not just believe it because we heard it somewhere, but believe it because we saw it Amen. clearly taught in the Bible. Now here's a good place to start, the book of Hebrews. A great book on the deity of Christ. Look at verse number 3 of chapter 3. Now, we're talking about Jesus Christ, according to verse number 1. He's saying, consider, in verse 1, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Look at verse 3. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Okay, how much more glory? And as much as he who built the house hath more honor than the house. Now, you notice here that Jesus is to Moses as the guy who builds the house is to the house. Do you understand? Jesus Christ, the creator. It says in verse number four, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is who? God. So he's saying, look, Jesus Christ has so much glo more glory than Moses. He's not just another prophet. He wasn't just a follow-up like a modern-day Moses. No, he has as much glory in relation to Moses as he who hath built the house has to the house because Jesus created Moses is what's being taught here. Jesus is the creator, and then he says, hey, he that built all things is God. Now, you can see this same thing taught in John 1. Flip over to John chapter 1. While you're turning there, I'll read you Hebrews 1.8. But unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So when the Father spoke to the Son in chapter 1, verse 8, he said, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, a scepter of thy kingdom. Look at John 1. And John is a great book on the deity of Christ also. But look at John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Made by whom? The Word. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the light was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Look at verse number 11. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see that Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. This is where the Jesus only is mixed up. Okay? Jesus was with God and he was God. You know, either way you're into false doctrine if you try to separate it and say, well, he's not God. No, he was God. But then if you say, well, he wasn't with God, you're missing the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's a Bible doctrine. I'll show you a little later in the sermon, I'm going to show you the trinity occurring throughout the Bible. But think of John, Genesis chapter 1, the first chapter in the Bible. And God said. Now, is and God said singular or plural? Singular. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Okay, so there's a three in one. There's a trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, look if you would. We're in John 1. Flip over to John chapter 20. Just go to the end of the same book. John chapter number 20. This is when Jesus has risen from the dead. He's appearing to the disciples in the upper room. 
he's uh, showing them and, and uh, you know, that, that he's risen from the dead and, and he showed them his hands and his side and the disciples were glad when they saw him. But look at verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing and Thomas answered and said unto him my Lord and my God and Jesus rebuked him for that nope and Jesus saith unto him Thomas because thou hast seen me thou hast believed blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed now wait a minute why did Thomas say to him when he realized that he risen from the dead? He got on his knees and said, My Lord and my God. And what did he turn around and do? Bless him and say, You know what? I'm glad you finally believe that. Now look, when people in the Bible, flip over to the book of Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 22. Oh, good night, my Bible. There's a piece, there's a piece torn off the page. Somebody give me your Bible. I'm removing, I've removed the book of Revelation. <laughs> There's a page that tore out or something. That kind of threw me out. Look at verse number 8 of uh, Revelation 22. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith the unto me, See thou, do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God. How many times throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are people falling down and worshiping Jesus? And he never rebukes them. It's, they're always blessed whenever they're worshiping him, whenever they're bowing down to him. Here, they're saying, no, worship God. Don't worship me. I'm a human being. I'm one of your fellow servants, the prophets. Remember when Peter came to Cornelius' house in Acts 10, they fell down and worshiped him. Peter picked him up and said, I'm a man like you are. Do not worship me. And yet, throughout the Gospels, Jesus was receiving worship. Hey, remember what Jesus said to the devil in Matthew 4? It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. And yet, He received worship. Today, the Pope receives worship. People literally bow down and kiss His big toe. You know, or whatever. Kiss His ring. They literally do. Jesus, were you the one that was telling me that there was a statue, what was it, some saint or the Pope? Okay, in St. Peter's Basilica, when my wife visited it, you know, this is back before she was saved, and, and she lived in Europe, so she went there, and the toe was almost missing from so many people kissing the toe of this statue that the toe was worn off. I mean, is that insane? It doesn't sound very sanitary either. <laughs> I mean, but, but anyway, they're kissing the toe of a man. And you know, you've seen how people get when they get around, you know, Pope Ratzinger or whatever stupid name. What's his name? Ratzinger? Joseph Ratzinger. But then he gives himself Benedict. What's with all these wicked people changing their name all the time? It seems like everybody who's wicked, were we talking about this today? They all change their name. Like Barack Obama, that's not even his name. What's his real name? Like Barry something? Santoro. Santoro. Barry Santoro. He, you know, it sounds like a baseball player or something. So, you know, if you're going to be president, I guess, you change it to your Muslim name, Barack Hussein Obama. You know, he gave himself that name. And uh, that's, I don't know what that has to do with the <laughs> You know, these popes have to give themselves a cool name so that they can, and then it makes them like God or something. You know, and uh, people worship him, and it's wicked. Him only shalt thou serve. Only one person should we worship. And call our Lord and our God, and that's and Jesus Christ falls in that category because he's a part of of the Godhead, as the Bible calls it. But look back at Revel. Look back if 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 I haven't uh, commandeered your Bible. Look back to Revelation, chapter two. Revel I'm sorry, Revelation chapter three. Look at Revelation chapter three. This is the letters to the seven churches where Jesus is speaking, and. Uh, in Revelation chapter 3, when he's talking to the church of uh, the Laodiceans, 
This is what he says in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now people will try to twist the scripture. And they'll try to say, oh, Jesus was God's first creation. Like he was created by God. But wait a minute. Remember what it said in John 1.1? 1, 1? All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Remember how it said, he that built all things is God, and Jesus Christ was the one who created Moses, and Jesus is the creator? All this is saying, he's the beginning of the creation of God. Hey, when it says, in the beginning, Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So that's Jesus talking. Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God. He is the beginning. He's the creator. That's why he's the beginning of the creation. I mean, where does the creation start? With the creator. And that's Jesus Christ. This is the, nowhere in that verse will you find, oh, he was the first creation of God. If that's what God meant, that's what he would have said. But he said, no, he's the beginning of the creation of God. Another objection, turn back to Luke chapter 1. Another objection that people will raise, you know, you'll be out soul winning and you're, you know, you're giving people the gospel, trying to get them saved, and they've been influenced by the Jehovah's Witnesses or one of these other false teachings. You'll say to them that Jesus was God in the flesh. We saw it this morning in uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. God was manifest in the flesh. Amen. Preached unto, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Okay? But this is what people will say, and I'm sure you've heard people say this. No, he's the son of God. Right? You'll say, like, he's God. He's God in the flesh. No, he's just the son of God. But ask yourself this question. Have you ever wondered this? Why, it, why does the Bible call Jesus the Son of God. Because, you know, you, you wonder if He is God, which the Bible makes it clear that He is. Unto the Son He saith, Thy throne, O God. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon His shoulder, and His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the Mighty God. Spoken of Jesus Christ in Isaiah 9, 6. You say, well, why is He called the Son of God then? You know, it's confusing, right? You know? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, what's that about? The Bible explains why he's called the Son of God. Look at Luke 1.35, and it explains it right here. Look at verse 34. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Because, you know, basically the angel's telling her you're going to give birth to a child. She's saying, wait a minute, I know not a man. I have never been with a man, so how am I going to have a child? Verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So why is it? Why would the baby be called the Son of God? Because there was no human father. That's why. Because there was no human father, and the Holy Ghost and God's power would overshadow her, and, and basically place the child there in her womb, that's why, according to, I mean, if you want a biblical reason, it says right here, therefore, for that reason, he's saying, the holy thing that's born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now look, the Trinity is a Bible doctrine. You say the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Whether the word Trinity is in the Bible or not, the concept of the Trinity is there, of a Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Let's look at some instances where this is mentioned. Matthew 28. We're in Luke. Just flip back a few pages to Matthew chapter 28. I mean, there are many times where you'll find this combination in the Bible. Starts with Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image. Okay, that's plural. It says in uh, Matthew 28, verse number uh, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. There's your Trinity right there, right? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians chapter number 13. We'll see another mention of the, of the Trinity here. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, as it was called there. How about this? First, or 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. Right there, you got a trinity there. Three, three elements there. God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost. Right? 1 John 5, 7 obviously is the one that pops into our mind. Go ahead and turn there. 
1 John chapter 5, verse 7, towards the, toward the end of the New Testament here. So first we saw it described as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then we saw, you know, God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. Look at 1 John 5, 7. It says, For there are three that bear a record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now that's the Trinity. Three are one. Okay, you see, I don't understand that. Just because you don't understand something, and then you say, well, I'm not going to believe it. Look, if you understood the whole Bible, you'd be God. I mean, the Bible's an infinite book. Whether or not we comprehend that fully or understand that fully, we see it in the Bible and we believe it because it says these three are one. Now, look, there's different ways to help illustrate this. For example, water, H2O, can be in three different formats. You know, and we, we can see basically the Trinity in nature. For, you know, water, whether it be ice or liquid or steam, it's still water. I mean, it's the same thing. It's just in three different manifestations, okay? Three different formats, if you will. You know, you, you think of uh, Jesus Christ, okay? God manifested himself in the flesh, or in the Bible. That's Jesus Christ, his physical manifestation. The Holy Spirit. Now you say, well, how do we know that the Holy Spirit is God? People will try to say the Holy Spirit is like a force. Or that he's just like an influence. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Obviously, if the Holy Spirit can be grieved, okay, if the Holy Ghost can be quenched, grieved, he can sorrow, okay, and the Bible says in the book of Job, I don't have the scripture down in my sermon, but the Spirit of the Lord hath created me, it says in the book of Job. That God, basically, he said, I was created by the Holy Spirit, okay. Another, you know, you, you, you really find the Trinity in the Genesis 1, if you, really, if you really stop and think about it, you know, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Okay. Now, in 1 John 5, 7, what's the difference here in this list, though? Because this is a little different than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. What do we have? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now, why does it say the Word? Who is the Word? Well, we saw that in John 1, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory, as of the only begotten of the Father. But here's the problem. People will try to separate the Word of God from Jesus. And a lot of people today will not believe that the Bible is the Word of God. People today are teaching. Well, the Bible was written by God. They'll say, well, the Bible was written by God. You know, it's, it's a book that God wrote. I've even heard preachers say, God may have probably wrote many other books, too, you know, that are up in heaven. He's got a whole library we'll read when we get there. Uh, okay, where'd you get that idea? Well, this is a book that God wrote. Wrong. This book contains, and I'm not talking about the physical book, the leather, the paper. I'm talking about these words, okay? These words are the Word of God. Now, look, that may seem like a radical concept. But that's what everybody used to believe and preach. That's what I grew up being preached. But today, we've been influenced by a bunch of philosophy and false teaching. Look, the Bible is a book that's meant to be understood. You pick it up, you read it, you understand it. It's not something that you need to go to a foreign language or go to some college to learn or have some guy explain it to you and teach you. Hey, the Holy Spirit will teach you the Bible. Look at, just real quickly, just flip over to chapter 2, verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. You see that? So is there anything in the Bible that you can't learn on your own? Is there anything in the whole Bible that would be impossible for you to learn unless someone teaches it to you? No. He says you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing, which is talking about the Holy Spirit, teacheth you of all things, and is truth and is no lie. And even if it is taught you, you shall abide in him. So to say, well, it's impossible to learn the Bible without somebody, you know, teaching it to you. Now, if you're an unbeliever, that's true. Philip went to the Ethiopian eunuch and said, understandest thou what thou readest? He said, how can I, except some man should guide me? That's because he's an unbeliever. He was the natural, unsaved man. Once you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You have that anointing that teaches you all things. You say, well, why do I come to church then? 
You don't come to church because you need me to tell you what the Bible says or what it means. You come to hear preaching that's just going to teach you more, that's just going to help you grow more, that's going to challenge you or encourage you, build you up, explain things to you, help you grow. But it's not something where you have to get it from Pastor Anderson or you're just not going to get it. I mean, I people, people think that somehow... It, it's funny, I was just mentioning this this morning. I was talking to somebody. They think, oh man, you know... You must have got that from Pastor Anderson. Like there's anything unique that I teach. Can somebody name for me one thing that I preach where I'm the only one who preaches it? I don't care what you name. And you say, oh, but you preach all this radical stuff. Yeah, but I can name for you hundreds of people who preach and teach and believe the same thing. No matter what you name. I mean, you can name any doctrine. There are millions of people, because guess what? We all, if we all have the same Bible and the same Holy Spirit... We're all reading the same thing. We're all going to believe the same things. And so, you know, I'll run into people that I've never met before. They believe exactly what I believe on A, B, C, D, E, F, Y. Because I didn't make it up. I'm not some cult leader where, you know, you've got to come here to get my revelation. No. The anointing that you have will teach you. You don't need a history book to teach you the Bible. Amen. You don't need somebody to say, well, you need this other book. You can't, under and unless you have this book... You're not going to be able to understand the Bible. This book will interpret the Bible. Is that what this says? No. It says you need the anointing and the word. That's it. And you've got it. You don't need another book, another knowledge. And, you know, we, we, we criticize the Mormons for adding their, you know, Book of Mormon. But wait a minute. What about Baptists who are doing the same thing? They add their commentary. They add this and say, oh, you've got you to read this book. You've got to say this. You know, wait a minute. This is all we need. Other preaching is helpful. You know, God commands us to go to church mainly to get around other believers. Also, to believe like us. And mainly so that we can get, you know, grouped up so we can go out and do the work. You know, go out and do the soul work. But wait a minute. We don't need this book to teach us. Now, what happens if we don't have that, you know, this is a song book. But, you know, we're pretending this is deep, deep, I'll read it for you to cover. Deep theology. This is what the subtitle is. Go down deep, stay down long, come up dry. All right? This is, you know, Mr. Theological book from the seminary, cemetery. And, uh, you know, you study that and you're going to know the Bible. Now look. If I'm just reading the Bible, for example, because these are some of the radical things I preach. You know, people criticize our church or they quit the church. And they, oh man, he's crazy, teach all this radical doctrine. Okay, these are some of the radical, wild doctrines that I teach. Okay? Like, because I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and that the Word became flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. That God's Word is God. Which is what the Bible says. Okay? The Bible says, this is, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now ask yourself this question. You say, why are you preaching this? We need to understand doctrine. Don't just want some little sugar stick or something. You need to get the meat and potatoes on Sunday night. Okay? Think about this now. Was Jesus Christ always flesh? Ask yourself that question. No. He was made flesh. Right. Yeah, you're right. He wasn't. Because in, in, in John 1.14, he was made flesh and dwelt among us. That means before that, was he flesh? Before that? No. He became flesh. He was manifest in the flesh. Okay? The Word was manifest. Now, the Word, people just say, oh, that's just a name given to Jesus. And, and they'll, they'll go even further. They'll say this, well, if you study Greek philosophy, then you'll understand the Logos. And just by, look, just by quoting a word in another language doesn't mean it means anything different. I mean, the word Logos just means word. In Greek. It's just the Greek word for word. Oh, but you got to understand the logos. Okay, why don't we understand palabra? <laughs> you must understand the palabra. <laughs> because you live in Arizona. No, it, you know, Spanish, Greek, so what? It means word. It's a bunch of letters that form together and make a sound that means something. It's a word. Oh, but the logos, these philosophers believed in like, kind of like Star Wars, like the force of the universe was called the logos. And so John was trying to like bring the gospel onto their level and relate it to their false religion and their philosophy. 
I mean, it's unbelievable to think that you... And, and this is what they say. That's why you have to go to Bible college or you wouldn't know that. I've had people tell me that. So you're telling me that in order to understand John 1, I have to go to a college or a Greek philosopher or some guy in a toga that needs to put on a pair of pants to teach me what the Bible means? No. I've got the Holy Spirit... I pick up John 1.1. 1, 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And what is called the Word of God? All throughout the Bible, all the way from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, God said to Abraham, I will show unto you the Word of God. Amen. All throughout the Bible. What is the Word of the Lord? Let me speak unto you the Word of God. And it was always Scripture that was coming out of their mouth. And then here we get to John 1. We're supposed to believe it's, you know... Uh, you know, it's just it, the force, Lagos. It turned out it's really God, and the dark side is Satan. That'd be like I'm supposed to give the gospel to some Star Wars geek, and I have to explain to him in his turn. Okay, Darth Vader is kind of like the devil. I know he was born of a virgin, and everything. Don't let that confuse you. You know, and by the way, these movies. That's why these movies are are occultic. You should yeah. watch out for them. I'm, I'm being, let me be serious now. In the Star Wars movie, Darth Vader is born of a virgin. Yeah. That's a little bit blasphemous. Jesus Christ is the only one who was born of a virgin, right. my Amen. friend. Amen. Although today they're making babies in a laboratory that are born of a virgin, but that's a whole other sermon. That's my sermon on IVF, you know, in, virtu in vitro fertilization. But, but what I'm saying is, uh, you know, no, you don't relate the Bible to man's book. This is God's Word. And anyone who just starts reading, think about this now. In Genesis 1, and gets to John 1, they're going to have already read hundreds of times what the Word of God means, and what the Word of the Lord is. And then when they see in the beginning was the Word, they're going to see, okay, that Word was from the beginning. And hey, it was with God. Hey, it was God. And then it became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. And I can prove it to you further that, that Jesus and the Word are one and the same. It's one of those radical things that I preach. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19. Revelation number 19. It says in verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now you say, oh, that's just a name for him. That's just what they call him. What? That name makes no sense. Word. What do you, what, oh, I think I'm going to name my son Word. Word. But he said up in verse 11, his name, he said he was called what? Faithful and true, and his name was called the Word of God. Look at chapter 21. Flip over to 21. He said his, he, he, he was called faithful and true. His name was called the Word of God. Look at verse 5 of chapter 21. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So what is his name? Faithful and true. These words are faithful and true. Flip over to chapter 22 and verse number 6. I'm going to borrow your Bible again, Brother Dave. All right. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. So he just finished telling us in chapter 3 that he was the faithful and true witness. Then in chapter 19 he says he is called faithful and true. Then in chapter 21 he says... These words are true and faithful. Then in chapter 22, he says, these sayings are faithful and true. Okay? So look, the second person of the Godhead, eternity past, was the Word. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. The Word became flesh, born of a virgin. The Holy Ghost came upon Mary. Therefore, he was called the Son of God. Why was he called the Son of God? Because the Spirit of the Lord came upon Mary and overshadowed her with God's power when she became with child, when she conceived in her womb the Son of God. And so that's doctrinally where that all fits in. You go back into eternity past, it was not a flesh and blood Jesus. He was made flesh and dwelt among us, okay? And we beheld His glory. Titus 1-2 is another great verse showing us that the Word of God is from eternity past. 
when he says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That promise of eternal life existed before the world began. But look at John chapter 6. John chapter number 6. And by the way, here, here's another teaching that, that people say, oh man, the rad radical teaching. You know, uh, that Pastor Anderson, you know, he's crazy. Because I teach what literally, what literally almost all Christians believed throughout history until the 1800s, okay? Which is the fact that Jesus Christ spent three days and three nights in hell. And they say, oh, no, 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 oh, man, you know, false doctrine, this is that. And yet, here's a clear scripture for you. Don't turn there, but I'll read it for you. But this is a perfect example of what I'm talking about. He seen, this is Acts 2.31, you don't have to turn there. He seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. Neither his flesh did see corruption. Here's what they'll say to that. They'll say, oh, wait a minute, that's not hell. You've got to go back, it's Sheol, it's Hades. But wait a minute, if you and the Holy Spirit just got the Bible out and read it, you think hell's a good place or a bad place? You've already, by the time you get to Acts 2.31, you've already read the word hell about 40 sometimes in the Bible, and you know it's a bad place every time it's mentioned. And here we are, just taking the Bible straight for what it says. Did you know that there are like over 450 references in the Old Testament to a burnt offering, a burnt sacrifice? Every sacrifice in the Bible is a burnt offering. Why? What did it symbolize when they took a lamb, shed the blood, sprinkled it on the altar, and then burned it with fire? Why was the Passover not to be eaten raw, not to be sodden with water, not to be boiled? It must be roast with fire. The Bible flat out says it. You're just, if you say, well, Jesus didn't go to hell, you're denying Acts 2.31 where it says he went to hell. That's right. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. <clears throat> you say, well, wait, you know, wait a minute. You know, it's just Hades. It's just Sheol. It's the, the place of the dead. That's not what the Bible says. If you want to just believe stuff that the Bible doesn't say, the Bible says hell. I just believe it's hell. I mean, it's that simple. He was in hell. Let me prove it to you even further. Jesus was dead for three days and three nights. He said in Revelation, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Now let me ask you something. Are people in heaven dead, according to the Bible? Jesus Christ said, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So when Jesus was walking on this earth, he said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and was glad when he saw it. And they said, thou art not 50 years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? And what did Jesus say? Verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And that's why he took up stones to stone. Because he was claiming to be God. Because he was God. Another proof of the deity of Christ. He said, before Abraham was, I am. But wait a minute. Abraham rejoiced to see his day. He saw it. Why did he see it? Because he's alive right now. Amen. And guess what? He was alive even before Jesus rose from the dead. You know, dispensationalists and everything think there was some resurrection when Jesus rose that all these saints, you know, moved from hell to heaven or whatever garbage. Look, God's not the God of the dead, but of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are classified as alive while Jesus was walking this earth because they were up in heaven alive. Jesus was not alive for three days and three nights, my friend. He was dead. People that are in hell are called dead. Revelation 20. Death and hell gave up the dead which were in them. The dead were judged according to their works. Jesus said, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I'm never going to die. When I breathe my last breath, the body will die, but I'll still be alive in heaven. If I'm dead for five minutes, God, it's not that I'm just going to raise again someday. My body will raise again. I will continue to live. If I die, then God lied. And so the Bible makes it clear that, hey, Jesus Christ suffered our punishment in hell. Then he had the keys of hell and of death. He defeated death. He rose from the dead. By the way, he rose from the dead. He didn't descend from the dead. You know, they tried to say, oh, he was up in heaven during that time. 
how is that being dead? It's really attacking the death, burial, and resurrection. If you think about it, I mean, it's, it's like he's not even dead. He's, he's up in, in, in heaven. Or, or, even weirder, he's in this good side of hell. That's what they say. You're laughing about it, but that's what they believe. You ought to laugh. It is. Everybody laugh. Have a good laugh. Can you believe it? You know what Adolf Hitler said? Adolf Hitler said this. He said, with enough, if you repeat enough over and over again, and you keep repeating the same thing, he said, you can get people to think that paradise is hell and that hell is paradise. And Baptists today, independent fundamental Baptists will tell you, Jesus went to hell, that means he went to paradise. Yeah. That's what they say. That's what they'll tell you. They'll say, oh, when it says he went to hell, it really means he went to paradise, which is right next to hell. Now, look, I know there's a place in California called Paradise, California. <laughs> I know there's a place in Michigan called Hell, Michigan. Okay, and I know that, you know, but, but I mean, to sit there and tell me that it's paradise in the center of the earth? Has anybody ever looked at a, a picture of geology lately? Of, of what? Have you ever looked at a cross section of the earth? It's pretty hot down there. Yeah. That's, you know, that's a little too hot for me to go on vacation. <laughs> paradise, you know. You've won an all expense trip to paradise. You're going to hell. Oh man, it's a little hot down here, but it's really beautiful. Paradise in the center of the earth? Unbelievable. But these are, and they're basing it where Jesus said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise, to the thief on the cross. That's because the thief on the cross went to heaven. And guess who he was with when he got to heaven? God. And guess who Jesus is? God. That's why, that's why Jesus said in John 3.13, he said, no man hath ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John 3.13, he said, the Son of Man is in heaven right now. That's why he could say to the thief on the cross, you'll be with me in paradise today. He didn't say, come on down, buddy, we're going to hell. But don't worry, it's the good side. Now, where are you going to get this doctrine that there's a good part of hell, a cool spot? from some theologian that'll tell you, well, oh, well, Hades and the underworld and the Greek underworld and, you know, you know, you got to have some theologian teach it to you. Otherwise, you'd know every time the Bible... And plus, if it was such a wonderful place, why is Jesus so anxious to get out of there? Saying, hey, my soul shall rest in hope for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou so... You know, he wants to get out of there. Okay, he doesn't want to stay there. It's a bad... Hell's a bad place. I, I know it's... I know it's a really radical doctrine I'm teaching you, but hell's always a bad place. It's never somewhere that you want to go, okay? <laughs> never. Calm down. It's not a heresy that I'm preaching. It's a bad place. Plus, hey, what, what, may, what sense does it make? Jesus could pay for our sins just by getting a beating, and yet people who are unsaved have to go to hell to pay for their sins? Tell me how that... Tell, explain to me how that makes sense. Jesus could pay for... For our sins, just by being beaten with a whip and punched in the face and spat upon, but yet we have to go to hell if we're unbelievers to pay for our sins? No, that doesn't make any sense. Jesus paid our punishment, okay? And he faced God's wrath in hell, okay? That was part of it. That's why in Jonah chapter 2, when Jonah was prophesying Jesus Christ, because he was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, and Jesus said in Matthew 12 40, for as Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so also shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That's not talking about the cave he was in. He said the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And by the way, he was there for three days and three nights. He wasn't crucified on Friday night. That's two days and one night. He was there for three days and three nights, okay, and rose on the first day of the week. You know, I've taught that in other sermons and proved that in the Bible. But he was down there and Jonah was a picture of that. Jonah said, Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. He talks about the seaweed being wrapped around his head when he was in the whale's belly in Jonah chapter 2. But then he talks about going down to the bottoms of the mountains and how the earth with her bars was about me forever. That's talking about hell. That's talking about, you know, he was speaking of Jesus Christ. Just like in Psalm 16, when David said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, this spake he of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. That's what the resurrection is. His soul was not left in hell. He resurrected. 
from the dead. You see, that's the difference between his, that's part of the difference between his resurrection and, say, the raising of Lazarus. Remember when Lazarus was raised? Lazarus was raised. But see, Lazarus did not, Lazarus was a believer. He was not really dead. What was the word that Jesus used about Lazarus? Lazarus is asleep, and I will go wake him. And he had been dead for four days. But was he really dead? No, he was a believer. He was saved. He was just sleeping. He did not go to hell for four days. Okay, and also, later on, eventually he died. You know, he, he, did, he was not raised up immortally like Jesus. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. He is raised to die, to die no more, the Bible says. Okay, so he rose again from the dead. He dieth no more, just like, you know, we will be after our resurrection. Lazarus was just sleeping. Those who are, you know, referring to the fact he wasn't really dead. I mean, people who are dead are in hell, according to the Bible. And God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And so the Bible's clear on that. And all that, that whole spiel about, you know, teaching that Jesus Christ, but that, that in of itself, just explain that to you, I just proved that Jesus was God about four times, just in that explanation. He said, I am. He said, the Son of Man is in heaven right now. He said all these different things. But look at John 6. Mm. John chapter number 6. Now, the book of John is a great book on the deity of Christ. There, there are seven great I am's in the book of John. You remember how when Moses asked what God's name was at the burning bush? He said, I am. He said, tell them that I am has sent you. He gave himself that name. Well, Jesus made all these I am statements. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. He said, I am the good shepherd. Remember it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He said, I am the good shepherd. Okay. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He said, before Abraham was, I am. I mean, just on and on he's saying, there are the seven great I am's. You know, the good shepherd, the bread of light, the light of the world, and on and on. Now, this is where Jesus is giving his sermon, where he's preaching to the Pharisees. They don't really understand what he's saying. He's talking about how he's the bread of life. Okay? And that's what he's talking about in John chapter 6. Look what he says in verse number uh, 47. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, that's a great verse on salvation right there. It's not about your works. It's not about how good you are. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Now, watch what he says. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread... He shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, what's he explaining here? He's comparing himself to the manna that came down from heaven. Now, the Jews said to him, show us a sign. And he says, okay. You're, and and they, they actually bring up the subject of the manna. They, he says, you know, show us a sign. And they say, our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. Forty years with Moses, what work is thou? He said, you know what? Moses is not the one that gave you the manna. It was God. And he said, if a man ate that bread, he would, you know, he would basically... Whoops, I just spilled my water. He would basically die. He's not going to live forever. Okay? Keep your finger here. Look back at Deuteronomy chapter 8 real quick. I just want to show this to you. This is the last thing I'm going to show you in this sermon. Deuteronomy chapter number 8. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 8.3. I want, I want you to listen really carefully to this point. You gotta, when, when you read the Bible, and, and boy, if you were here this morning, you understood the emphasis on God's words. Every word. You know, just basically every single word matters. It's not just the thought. It's not just the idea. Look at verse 3. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna. Why? Which thou knewest not, neither thy fathers know. Why did he do it? That thou... He said that he might make thee to know... That man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. So what was he trying to teach them with that manna? He was teaching them. He fed them with manna. 
to teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So what did the manna represent? God's word. The, the, basically, in Deuteronomy, the way he explains it in Deuteronomy, he said, hey, the manna represented God's word. You should read the Bible every day. You know, they had to get up every morning and get that manna. And, it, and, you know, they had to get it that day. And if they skipped the day, you know, it was gone. You know, they had to get it in the morning. They'd get up and they'd get the manna. It represented God's word, according to this. He said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now look at John 6. Watch how Jesus is using the same thing. He's using the same type of words, the same phrases here. When he says, you know, your father, verse 49, your fathers did eat man in the wilderness or dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat there but not die. I'm the living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? They're basically arguing with him, saying like, what are you talking about? Then Jesus said to them, you're right, I'm sorry. And he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And they're like, whoa, what are you talking about? For my flesh is meat indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. Look at this last phrase. This is the key. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? The man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, the Jews are just perplexed. They don't understand what he's saying. They don't understand the illustration. They're taking him literally. Like he's going to give them his literal flesh to eat. Okay. This is what the Roman Catholics believe today. They tell you, oh, this magical thing. You know, they, they give you that little cracker, that little wafer. They put it on your tongue and they go like, you know, and, and then it becomes, you know, the flesh of Jesus, right? It, you know, right there in your stomach, which is cannibalism, which is weird. And they say when you drink the cup, it literally becomes blood. The Bible says never to eat blood. He can't be speaking literally because in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, he commanded, do not eat blood. Then in Acts 15, he reiterated, do not eat the flesh with the blood. Take out the blood of your meat before you eat it. Watch what he says. He's going to explain himself because they're, they're perplexed. They don't get it. They're like, what are you talking about? We're going to eat you? But then he explains it. The first hint here in verse 57, he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. That should ring a bell with them with the manna that he's talking about. Look at verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in uh, the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, does this offend you? I'm sorry. What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? He said, look, I came down from heaven and eventually you'll see me ascend up where I came from. But now he explains the parable in verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. What does the word quicken mean? To make alive. And remember what he kept saying? He that eateth me shall live by me. He said, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. He said... It is the spirit that quickeneth or makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. Now look, that's pretty clear. He said, look, I'm not talking about you literally eating my physical flesh off my body. He said, I'm talking about my word. It's not the flesh. The flesh profited nothing. He said, the words that I say unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Just like your fathers ate manna in the wilderness. That was a picture of God's word to teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's saying, look, I'm like the manna in that I came down from heaven. I'm like the manna in that I represent the word of God. I'm like the manna because if a man eateth me, he shall live by me. He said, it's not my flesh per se, it's my word. Now look, 
Stop and ask yourself this question. If Jesus is not the Word, you know, people try to say, oh, Jesus is not the Word. You know, the Word's just a name given Him, but the Bible, the Word, like the sayings, the words of God, the Scripture, totally separate from Jesus. Well, then why would Jesus say, eat my flesh to be saved? But then He turns around and says, no, you don't get it. He said, it's not, we're not talking physical flesh. We're talking about that I represent a food for your soul, the Word of God. And look, a person cannot be saved without that Word. The Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And they're all, this is an illustration, this shouldn't have been new to them. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah eats the Word of God. He's given a book and told to eat it, and he actually chews it up and eats it. I mean, it's a, it's a symbol, symbolic. Job said, thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was a joy and rejoicing of my heart. In Revelation 10, John is told to eat a scroll with God's word on it. Okay. The point is here that people will try to separate the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. He was explaining to them, look, the manna came down from heaven. It was a physical food that did not give eternal life. It was just a physical food. But it was symbolic of the Word of God. He's saying, that's me. I'm the Word of God. I'm the true manna. I'm the bread of life. I'm the Word of God that came down from heaven and you must eat this manna, is what he's saying. You must eat this bread of life, and it's my, it's my words. You know, hey, who here has ever met Jesus in person, physically? Nobody. If, if you say you do your life, whenever I'm out soul I'll, I'll run into these people sometimes. Oh yeah, Jesus appeared to me. You know what I'm talking about? Who's ever met somebody that said that? Up? Well, you work in that nursing home. Where the, people probably tell you that a lot in that place. But, you know, I have people, oh, Jesus appeared to me. And I, I always ask them the same thing. I always say, well, did he have, you know, did he, did he have, like, really long, flowing hair? They're like, oh, yeah. I said, well, that wasn't him. You know, the Bible says he <laughs> should have short hair. But, but anyway, hey, here's the thing. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, last of all, that's what Paul said, last of all he was seen of me. That's what Paul said. And guess what? Next time anybody sees him, every eye shall see him, the Bible says. Every eye shall see him when he comes. So none of us have physically seen Jesus. So let me ask this. How can we be saved? How are we saved then? Through His Word. That, how do you know Jesus? Did He physically come to you at the well? Did He come to you at night like Nicodemus? Did He come to you and speak to you? Nope. This is how you know Jesus. Through the, the Word. And let me tell you something. The Word was with God. The Word was God. See, when you, you have to understand that the, the Trinity is a Bible doctrine. It's called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. It's called the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. It's called these three are one. Okay? Jesus said this. You know, because people try to say, oh, they're just one in purpose. One in spirit. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I mean, I, you know, they say, oh, you and your wife are one. I had some Mormons tell me. I said, what if I said to you, if you've seen me, you've seen my wife. You know, no. We're two different, we're two distinctly separate people. But Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And then Philip said, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. He said, Philip, have you been with me so long and you haven't known me, Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? What do you want me to show you? He's saying, I am the Father. I mean, how much clearer could you get in John 14 when he sits there and tells Philip, look, how can I show you the Father when I am the Father? I and my Father are one. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the true vine. I'm the bread of life. I'm the resurrection. I'm the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha and Omega. There's no room for anything else, folks. If he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, where does that place God? Because he's one with God, because he is a part of that Godhead. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. All the way back, Genesis 1 is when it starts being taught. And it finishes up in Revelation 22. It's a Bible doctrine. It's always a red flag when people question this. And they, they start to, you know, well, you know, he's just the Son of God. Or, well, you know, it's just the Jesus only. Jesus only. You know, there's no Trinity. The Holy Ghost is not part of it. It's clear. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.